content to be where the light and darkness meet on the edge of the horizon through the trees. I am a narcissist crippled with self doubt. I've got a courage that brings me to my knees. Hello, hi, and howdy. How's everybody doing today? I certainly hope everybody's doing well, and I hope everybody had a wonderful and a safe New Year's. It's kind of hard to believe 2023 is here. It's like 2022 went so fast. At least it did for me. Um, I can't speak for everybody, but today's story is a suggestion from Elizabeth Salvador. And if you're watching, thank you so much, Elizabeth, for the suggestion. This is another one of those cases that are going to be hard to hear. Um, I know the research on it was very hard to get through. These types of stories are just proof that evil exists in this world. Uh, today, we're going to cover Scotty McMillan's story. Jillian Tate dated a man named Lauren McMillan for a few years. Uh, together, they had two sons. Firstborn was in September of 2008, and his name was Ryan. In 2010, Jillian was pregnant again, but this time Lauren left Jillian and moved back to Kansas with his mother, which left Jillian pregnant alone um, with just her and their firstborn, Ryan. On the 26th of January in 2011, uh, Jillian gave birth to their second son, Scott Jacob McMillan. Per Jillian's family, uh, Lauren didn't show up and Jillian was alone in the hospital when she gave birth to Scott, a.k.a. Scotty. When Jillian and Scotty were released from the hospital, they went to stay with Jillian's sister, Kim. Jillian did have a wild side, though no signs it had to do with any type of drugs or anything like that. She was said to be rather promiscuous. Um, she was also said to enjoy rave parties. And what I could find, a rave is a dance party where performing DJs play electronic dance music. I read one of the problems at these raves is drug activities, but again, there was no evidence that Jillian dabbled in drugs, so maybe she just liked to dance. I don't know. With Jillian trying to be a single mother, uh, funds were tight. When she began having financial difficulties, she ran a personal ad, which she included both babies and their names in, and she stated she was searching for a sugar daddy, which is generally an older man taking care of a younger woman, but not always. It could really be any ages. But while Lauren and his family appeared to have a very little relationship with the boys, Jillian's family seemed very close to the boys. Jillian's sister Kim, um, the sister Jillian lived with when Scotty was born, spent a lot of time with the boys. Uh, she often referred to Scotty as little Scooter Pop. Jillian's father, Stephen, also spent a lot of time uh, with the boys. He was said to refer to Scotty as his Scooter Crunch. Now, let me stop just a minute. I want to say that this sounds like one of those families that if Jillian was overwhelmed or just couldn't do it, her family would have stepped in. Um, in too many of these stories, that appears to be the case, but instead they take the child's life. Jillian's family also stated that prior to Jillian meeting Gary Lee Fellenbaum, the children had a good life. And that is what the family said, but I'm going to add that in no way does that excuse what happened. Jillian's obligation to protect her children doesn't just end when she meets a man. Now, it appears that Jillian's personal ad for a sugar daddy to take care of her and her children didn't work out as planned as in mid to late 2014. Jillian got a job at Walmart in Parksburg, Pennsylvania. By this time, Jillian was 31 years old. Not long after beginning her job, Jillian met 23-year-old Gary Lee Fellenbaum and 21-year-old Amber Fellenbaum. Apparently, Gary and Amber were going through a divorce but still resided together in a two-bedroom single-wide located in a trailer park at 96 Hope Lane in West Cowan Township, which is also in Pennsylvania. They had an 11-month-old daughter also living with them. Gary and Jillian hit it off and began dating, and almost immediately, in October of 2014, Jillian, along with Ryan and Scotty, moved into the trailer with Gary, Amber, and their daughter. 
Per court documents, the adults in the house all had relations together, and I'm not sure that that has anything to do with the story, but it's in the court documents. According to Jillian, um, Gary was very controlling. He only allowed her to sleep an hour each night, and he made her run the household on $5 per day. And apparently this bothered her, but not his treatment of her children. As soon as they moved in, Gary began to beat on the boys. And I'm going to insert my opinion um, where it isn't asked for, but why would any mother allow a man that she just met to discipline her child? I mean, at the most, if he had any issues with Ryan or Scotty, he should have spoken to Jillian about it and let her decide if she felt it warranted punishment. And if it did, she should have been the one to punish her children. We're not talking about a man that she grew to know and love and he stepped up as a father figure to these babies. We're talking about a man that she literally just met. Gary didn't just pop the boys, um, which in my opinion is also too far for a man she barely knows, but he was beating the boys. Um, He beat the boys so badly that the last two weeks prior to Scotty losing his life, Ryan wasn't sent to school where he was in kindergarten at Rainbow Elementary in Coatesville, Pennsylvania, because they were sure that the teachers would report them to child services for the many bruises and signs of abuse on Ryan's little battered body. If, as an adult, you know to hide something, you know it's wrong. Um, And it really is that simple. Um, It's not a hard concept. The school tried to make contact with Jillian and Ryan by phone, and they showed up at the address on file, but Jillian never alerted the school she was moving. Over the 23 days that Jillian and the boys lived with Gary and Amber, and yes, I said 23 days, they were punished not only with beatings, but often food was withheld. If a human goes too long without eating, Um, When they are finally given food, they have a hard time swallowing and digesting. So on the 2nd of November, Gary made the boys cinnamon and sugar toast for breakfast. It's not known for sure if Scotty couldn't or he wouldn't eat it, but he spit it out. And Gary, in all his glory, and apparently a legend in his own mind who felt he deserved complete respect, took Scotty not eating the toast as disrespect. He tried to force feed the toast to Scotty. When Scotty continued to spit the toast out, Gary began closed fist punching this baby in the head and the stomach. When he fell out of the chair, Gary got electrical tape um, out of the catch-all drawer in the kitchen. And for anyone who doesn't know um, what a catch-all drawer is, it's just what I call a drawer that um, I really think every kitchen has, that um, any and everything that'll fit in it can be found in it. But he took the electrical tape and he taped Scotty to the chair. He continued to punch this baby. Um, When he untaped him, he drug him into the room where he slammed Ryan and Scotty's head into the wall multiple times, hard enough that he actually left holes in the sheetrock in different spots. And somehow I bet this cowardly piece of shit feels like a big tough man now. The following day, again, Gary made cinnamon sugar toast for the boys to eat. And again, rather he wouldn't or he couldn't eat it, Scotty didn't. And again, this coward taped this baby to a chair and started punching him, closed fists like a grown man. He even made Ryan hit Scotty. And where was Jillian? I'm sure many of you are wondering. Well, per Jillian, she and Amber were just watching and laughing. She was watching this man torture her babies that she should have protected with her own life. And then um, she actually joined in. They made homemade weapons, um, such as a blue and white braided rope with duct tape around each end. And per Gary and Jillian... Um, they did this to protect Gary's hand. They call this a cat of many tails. Um, they've also used a frying pan, a wooden spoon, a metal curtain rod that they bent, and their fist to beat on these babies. 
um, both them and both of the babies. By now, Scotty was in desperate need of medical attention for internal injuries, but he didn't receive medical treatment. They untaped this baby and hung him and his brother upside down in the doorway and continued beating him while the three of these wastes of oxygen continued to laugh. While upside down and being hit, Scotty began to throw up. A few moments later, he lost consciousness. They untied him and they put him in a cold bath to try to revive him. They said that this had worked before. Um, he didn't wake up this time, however, and they were actually surprised, not concerned, but surprised. They did not call 911. Um, instead, they took Scotty's little limp body and laid it on a deflated air mattress. He had blood coming out of his ears, his nose, and his mouth by this point. They then told Amber to watch the boys, and Jillian and Gary went car shopping while Scotty lay there dying alone. On the 4th of November in 2014, at around 7.45 p.m., um, just 23 days after Jillian moved herself and her boys in with Gary Fellenbaum and his estranged wife, Amber, along with Gary and Amber's 11-month-old daughter, Amber dialed 911 and told a dispatcher that Scotty was unresponsive. This baby's little battered body couldn't take any more. Um, when the paramedics and law enforcement arrived at the trailer on Hope Lane, they immediately knew it was far more horrific than what Amber had told the dispatcher. They knew immediately that this baby had just been badly abused. Ryan was also found to be injured. Um, Scotty was rushed to Brandywine Hospital in Collin, Pennsylvania, and Ryan was rushed to Alfred DuPont Hospital for Children in Wilmington, Delaware. The three adults in the house were taken in for questioning, and all three of these jackasses told the truth about what had occurred. When investigators spoke to Ryan, his story matched the story of the three adults. Now, Ryan said that he learned if he tried to get away when he was being beat, he got it worse, but Scotty was too young to learn that, and I'm sorry, but both these boys were too young to learn that and should have never had to. It was determined that Scotty passed away from blunt force trauma after suffering days without medical attention for his internal injuries. In a statement from D.A. Hogan, he said, quote, Little Scotty McMillan is... Dead. He was systematically tortured and beaten. He was punched in the face and in the stomach. He was beaten with a homemade whip. He was lashed with a metal rod. He was tied to a chair and beaten. He was tied upside down by his feet and beaten. His head was smashed through a wall. In the state of Pennsylvania, someone's life is taken at the hands of another and torture is a factor. The penalty of the defendant also losing their life is on the table, and both Gary and Jillian face this penalty. Prosecutors in this case called this case the American Horror Story. They stated that when Scotty arrived at Brandywine Hospital, every doctor or nurse that saw his body cried. He was covered in bruises, lacerations, and puncture wounds. On the 6th of November, both Gary Fellenbaum and Jillian Tate were charged in the passing of Scotty McMillan and aggravated assault for the abuse on Ryan. They both took plea bargains to avoid the um, penalty of losing their life. Both Jillian Tate and Amber Fellenbaum agreed to testify against Gary Fellenbaum. However, uh, this didn't happen as he also ended up taking a plea. Jillian was sentenced to 42 to 94 years in state prison, which she appealed, claiming that she wanted leniency and mercy for telling the truth. And nope, sister, that's not how that works. Um, where was the mercy and leniency for your kids? Gary Fellenbaum was sentenced to life plus 10 to 20 years. And the good thing about his plea is that it did save Ryan from having to testify in open court. 
Amber Fellenbaum pled guilty to two counts of endangering the welfare of a child and recklessly endangering another person. She was sentenced to state prison for a term of six and a half to 16 years. When asked why this happened, um, Gary stated he felt disrespected by Scotty. And from the very bottom of my heart, I hope he is learning the true meaning of disrespect where he will spend the rest of his life. In court, Ryan read a letter um, he wrote to his mother, and y'all, this is beyond heartbreaking. Um, Dear Mom, you, Gary, and Amber are trapped in a house of torture. The torture was you guys. The victims were me and Scotty. Scotty got killed. I got beaten. You are the worst mother I've known. You watched us get hurt. I wish you never met Gary. He is really evil. He nearly killed me. You are the reason Scotty got killed. I thought parents were supposed to protect us. Now you are in jail for your time out. The Common Pleas Court Judge, William Mohan, stated in court to Jillian, Gary Fellenbaum may be a sociopath, but I'm not sure what that makes you. You're their mother. And I agree. Ryan was adopted. His adopted father also spoke. He said, I am not sure which child is more unfortunate. He said that life presents us all with challenges that we have to navigate. He said at times, Ryan recalls the abuse to him. These are the memories that he has. His memories are fear and pain and confusion as to why he wasn't protected. He told Jillian in court, Scotty died alone on a floor, and he watched it, and he was alone. Although Gary may have inflicted the fatal blows that finally unalived Scotty, ultimately the boy's well-being was your responsibility. You should have protected them. You protect your children. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this brings us to the end of little Scotty McMillan's story. And honestly, um, his very brave brother, Ryan, as well. Um, rest easy, Scotty. Rest easy, baby boy. And Ryan, if you ever see this, you are a very strong, very courageous, and very smart young man. Stay safe. And it sounds like you now have a father that will protect and love you. Um, if you haven't done so, please take a moment to like and subscribe, and until the next video, toodles. Narcissist, crippled with self-doubt I've got a courage that brings me to my knees I am equal parts